Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love online every Saturday at 1215 Pacific. And we and the, the details for that is down below in the description box. Anyway, we are going to deal with how we are to conduct ourselves through these last days. We have to ready ourselves not only to be uh, raptured up, but to be used by God during these last days. How is God going to use us? Can he use us? That is the question. Will he use us? And if he uses us, will we be a clean vessel of honor or will we be a contaminated waste? Hmm. So what the Lord uh, reminded me of, I was thinking about the message and what came to my mind is Sometimes if you think about a hospital setting and you can picture how God will at times, um, if you're in a hospital, let's say, and you are given a, a liquid medication, right? And, and they tell you, you have to take this straight on an empty stomach. Don't mix anything with it. Don't eat anything or drink anything before or after it for 30 minutes because they want it to really get into your system. Now imagine here you are taking this medication, but then you get a taste for a donut or you get a taste for a Coca-Cola and you drink that Coca-Cola or you eat that donut and have a cup of coffee because you forgot what the doctor said. What you are doing by doing that is diluting the effect, hopefully the positive effect of that either medication or that supplement they're giving you for your body. Now, what God showed me is when he uses us, we are vessels to be used by God. Now, if you are living a holy life, if you are drawn close to God, if Everything in your life is centered around the kingdom, the things of God, uh, about your father's business, being about your father's business in the kingdom with the body of Christ and with those who are without through evangelism. Whatever comes out of your mouth, whatever deed you do, the question is, are they coming out of a clean vessel? Is your ministry, is your, are your good deeds, are your acts of niceness, so to speak, out of a pure love? See, th this is the problem with us, and this is what God was putting on my mind. Some of us, we may be living a holy life. We may be faithful in the things of God, serving God, speaking for God, walking, talking, quacking for God, evangelizing, soul winning for God, teaching for God, counseling for God, whatever the case may be, singing for God. My question to you is, what else is going on deep down in the recesses of your spirit that nobody can see but God? Because even if you're doing everything if you're walking to the beat of God's drum, if you're singing in the key of his kingdom, if you are moving in the rhythm of his love, that's nice. But guess what? Something is missing if you are carrying bitterness in your spirit. Something is missing if you are judgmental and opinionated. Something is missing if you're unforgiving. And as far as you're concerned, they can go play on the freeway. And you'd love to be the one to run them over. See, you may have relatives, siblings, friends, neighbors, co-workers, whatever. Parents, children who have hurt you deeply. Who have offended you who have disappointed you. But the question is, how are you handling it? You want to be used by God. You want to do mighty exploits for God. That's good. How do you talk to your husband? 
How do you talk to your wife? How do you treat your kids when nobody's looking? What kind of things do you say to them? And why are you saying those things to your kids? What are you saying or doing to your co-workers, your, your church members? What are you doing? Are you short-tempered? Are you smart-alecky with them? Are you, are you uh, sarcastic? Hmm. Are you intolerant to other people's weaknesses, failures, fallacies, and <laughs> issues? What, what is your attitude? How do you handle them? The reason I'm asking you that is because God sees sometimes what you don't see. And what you don't see and what you refuse to deal with can make you and your ministry come up short. Come up short with the wisdom. Come up short with the love. Come up short with God's anointing. Why? You have to have God's anointing because it's only his anointing that breaks the yoke. But if your anointing is diluted, if your anointing is contaminated, watered down, if it is stagnant and you got toxins floating through your spirit, it's contaminating God's anointing, short-circuiting it. Listen, listen, listen. Try, try this. <clears throat> Think about this. You have a curl and iron for women, or you have a razor for men. It's electric. You want to shave. You women, you want to curl and style, flat iron your hair, whatever the case may be. And you're in a hurry. But your shade, your razor, your electric razor, and, and your curling iron has a short in it. So it works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. Listen to this. So while you are trying to hurry up and get the job done, you're trying to get a good, clean shave in a hurry, you're trying to get your hair done in a hurry, what happens? You get delay after delay after delay after delay. Why? Because it turns off on its own. Then it starts up on its own. You got to wait for it to get hot. Or you got you to gotta wait for the power to come back on for the short to get out of the way so you can use that electric razor. And what ends up happening? It's delaying your progress. It's delaying. It can make you late for an appointment. It could sabotage the very good thing you're scheduled to go and do. Why? Because it's only working part of the time. Which means the power that it needs to function is not there all the time. And what about your power? What about your power that you plug into God for? Is it working all the time? Is it readily available? Is it powered up? Or do you have to go through a whole bunch of apologies and, and, and the stuff? Because you know in your knowing that you got too many short circuits going on in your spirit. Hmm? Or try this. Try talking to someone who doesn't have a good signal. You're on the cell phone. You're driving through an area that doesn't have a good signal. And the voice goes in and out. And you're talking and it sounds like this. Yeah, I went to the store. And then I, I, did. And then I, I bought some eggs. And I, I bought some bread. And I needed to get some. That's horrible to listen to. The static is annoying. You can't get the sound clear. You can't understand what they're trying to articulate because it's coming out as it's going in and out. Why is it going in and out? The connection, the sound, sound, <clears throat> sound waves, 
are not coming. There's not a good connection to the cell towers. Hmm? Think about that. Do you, you want to serve God. Do you have a good connection with him? And with that, we are going to read, if I can find it, we are going to read 2 Peter, starting at verse 9. And the reason he's trying to encourage people is because sometimes your doubts, your fears, uh, life's vicissitudes can hinder your faith in that same manner. And the short circuits begin. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is repentance? I want to hear you say it. It's not an apology. Repentance is godly sorrow that results in change. That's repentance. All right. Here we go. Sorry. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of, the, of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. And I'm stopping there. So you see how, okay, picture this. I've told, I've said this before, so bear with me on this example. Picture yourself getting ready to go under anesthesia, or maybe they don't need anesthesia. Maybe you can have a twilight sleep or just have something relaxing you while they do minor surgery on you and you get to watch it. Maybe they're giving you a um, a heart, uh, what do you call those things that regulate your heartbeat? Maybe they're giving you one of those, or maybe they're giving you something, a, 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 a um Splint, I forget what they call it. A stint, a stint. Okay, so here you are. You're having something you can watch on the monitor. Or maybe you're getting a C-section, whatever. So you're watching this on the monitor. And the, and all the, all the medical staff has come in, they're doing their thing. But your doctor walks in because he's been out partying all night. Now he's got a hangover because he was drunk. He comes in half drunk with a hangover, splitting headache. The lights bother his eyes. He can't see straight. And he's not in his right mind. You could tell. You can tell he's still slightly under the influence of last night, doing what he ought not have done because he had a surgery to do on you. So here he comes in. He's late. So he doesn't do the scrubbing. He just says, just, just put the gloves on. Just put the gloves on me. I'll get in there and do my thing. He throws his ro the, the scrub clothes on, and they put the mask on him. And then he realizes he's got a cough, so he pulls the mask off because he feels like he can't breathe. And he's coughing all over you. <laughs> Would you want to tell this, that medical staff, never mind. Leave it alone. That man is not touching me. Or that woman is not touching me. Whoever the surgeon is. Why? You know they have not scrubbed completely. You know that they're not in their right mind. You know their lifestyle is interfering with their skill set. 
and you are afraid that you will end up with a septic, some type of an infection, a staph infection, an, a complication, they're liable to cough or sneeze while the knife is going on you and they're liable to jab one of your major organs. You know something is up and you, you don't want to risk that. How do you think God feels when he's got his children half-stepping, one foot on the banana peel, the other foot backsliding? But they're going to go out and win the world for Jesus. How do you think he feels? Hmm. You see, God wants us and we're going to be used by him. He wants us to be righteous, holy, clean living, clean walking, clean talking, clean attitude, clean spirit. Do, do you know when you are filled with bitterness and rage, when you are filled with unforgiveness, that brings on that high level of anger and you're, you're, you're short-circuited. Your fuse is short. You're easy to fly off at the handle. You have anger issues. You have temper tantrums. You don't know how to control it. You don't have that self-control. And somebody gets on your nerves or gets on your case while you're coming in to do something very sensitive that could put a person's life at risk. And you're trying to do this surgery filled, fuming with anger, all hot up under the collar, you're almost in a sweat, you're so angry. You really think that's a good time to do a surgery like that. See, the same way you can mess up a person's health by not being together, by not being ready to do this assignment, to take on this task, the same way you can mess people's lives up out there, by your lifestyle, by your attitude, by what they hear coming out of your mouth, by what they see in your temperament. Imagine a child that is afraid of you because when you go off, baby, you go all the way off and they're liable to have to wait for somebody to peel them off the wall. But you're in church clapping hallelujah, praise God. And they're looking up at you like, what a hypocrite. If people knew what they did to me, and what do they end up doing? They don't want any parts of God. They don't want any parts of the church. Why? Because of what you did to them when nobody was looking. When your anger was at an all-time high. We can so easily do damage when we're trying to do good. You can give somebody a compliment and because you're so full of cynicism, so full of sarcasm, so full of anger and bitterness that you say snide remarks. You mix in the snide remarks with the compliments. Well, you, well, you know how you like to do things. Of course, they're going to know what you mean while everybody else is, oh, isn't that sweet? Because they don't know that that was a dig. That wasn't a compliment. That was what you call a backhanded compliment. I'll slap you down while I'm giving you a smile and a compliment. Mm -hmm. And some of you are great at doing that. You're excellent at tearing other people down. But what does God say? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, baby, and you're operating out of his love, you are to edify. What does edify mean? Edify means build up. You got issues with somebody. Sometimes you got to just step your little happy hips, even you pastors. Sometimes you have to voluntarily step your little happy hips down out of the pulpit. Let some of your other ministers do the preaching for a month and you bear down with God and clean that crap out of your spirit because you're, you're, you're feeding your people with toxicity. And even though you're preaching the word, you're causing people to look at others through the corner of their eye, through judgment. Why? Because you have attitudes. You're judgmental. 
and you're teaching your people to be judgmental and intolerant. Do you see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Some of you are operating out of fear. Fear of failure. Fear of what they're saying about you behind your back. Fear of what people think about you. Fear of ruining your reputation. So what do you do? You you clamor and grab and grapple and make sure all your little following, all your little sheep, your fold is right up under you. You don't let them go visit other churches. You keep them close up under you like an overbearing, smothering parent. Why? Because you're afraid if they get too far away, they're liable to hear some things about you that you don't want out there. You don't want known. You got some secrets. You got some skeletons rattling in your closet. But you want them to think the best of you. So you make them think good of you by not letting them get around anybody else. So they can think you are the it, baby. Can't nobody overdo you, outdo you. And they'll never know if they never get to see the other preachers and other churches outdoing you. Because you're competing. You're not serving God. You're competing. It's a self-serving ministry with you. Well, remember this. These people are not your people. Mm -hmm. They're not your people. They're God's people, and so are you. But you're not going to be God's people long if you keep living out of your flesh, out of the dictates of your flesh. So, for all of you who want to serve God, think about it, baby. If you have to go to a job, you, you, you do your job interview, you get in there, you get ready to go on your first day, what are you going to do? Your clothes are going to be clean and iron smooth or, or unwrinkled, however you do it in the dryer. Your hair or your haircut, your beard, your everything's going to be groomed. Your shoes are going to be shined, everything. Why? Because you're going to put your best foot forward. Right? You're not going to go to that job half cock with a hangover. You're not going to do that because you want to make sure that you pass probation period. So you put your best foot forward. Why can't you do that for God? Why can't you put your best foot forward for him 24-7? All right. That's it. It's not going to be a long sermon. Just remember, if you want to serve God, baby, there are some things you're going to have to give up, some things you're going to have to pick up, some things you're going to have to look behind and deal with. Because no matter where you go, where you run, where you hide, that stuff going right there with you. And you are contaminating everywhere you go and everybody you deal with carrying that crap with you. So you've got to ask God. To give you the ability to forgive. You've got to ask God to heal your wounded spirit. So you don't walk around like many others hurting and hurting others while you're hurting. With your anger. With your temper. With your snide remarks. With your judgmentalism and intolerance. Ask God to clean you up. In every way, shape, and form. So that when he uses you. He is using a vessel of honor, not a contaminated mess. Amen? All right. God bless you.